Welcome to Inclusive Gathering Birmingham. My name is Danielle. Um, we've had another week where there's been more news of uh, longer lockdowns, schools being closed for longer, and um, I feel like there's been so many times where I've started off these online services saying, yes, it's been another hard week, let's, let's hang in there. Um, and it's hard, it's really hard. Um, but for us, I think what we want to do is do whatever we can to stay connected with one another, to have some consistency and to be creative in the ways that we encourage and support one another. So we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that we're planning coming up a little later on. Um, we've got a special guest with us today, the theologian and author Paula Gooder, who's going to be talking to us about uh, one of the stories that Jesus told. And we're really excited about that. And there'll be an opportunity to talk with her after this, after the gathering at 515 on Zoom. Um, so if you haven't been with us before, um, we are an inclusive, affirming, progressive church that really cares about digging deep into this tough stuff um, and having our welcome not be based on anything people do or don't do, but on just a desire to be together and to learn and to support one another. So uh, wherever you're at with faith or, or with no faith or whatever, you're very welcome to just come and be here as you are. Uh, so whether you're gay or you're straight, uh, whatever your gender identity, whatever your neurodiversity or neurotypicalness, uh, whatever your race or ethnicity, uh, ability, disability, um, please just come be with us as you are. And uh, we're constantly learning on how to um, to welcome a bit better. So um, in, in, the, in uh, the service such as it is online, I just invite you to... Uh, chat along in Facebook or on YouTube in the chat and comment and connect and um, if you feel comfortable join us afterwards for a chat at 5.15. I'm going to hand over for some music.
Hi everyone, I'm Josie. As part of our regular worship gathering, we have what we call our question for sharing to give people a moment to connect with each other. So we're going to ask you all a question and as we share our answer, you can also share your answers in the comments on Facebook Live or YouTube. So our question is, is there something that you're able to do in lockdown that is life-giving, hopeful or that helps you on tough days? Well, for me, once we settled down into the first lockdown last year, something about the way everything was stripped back made me notice how certain things that mattered to me had been absent, or if not absent, then at least not getting the time or priority that I'd have liked. For example, my best friend and I had always texted each other a lot, but we only saw each other every, I don't know, four or six weeks, and that'd be when we'd speak. But then I moved away from London and she's still there, so obviously we saw each other even less. We started catching up on the phone, but only occasionally. But knowing that we couldn't see each other once lockdown started changed things somehow. It brought the importance of the relationship into clearer focus. And so we agreed to have weekly phone calls every Friday. And we've kept that up every week since last year. I'm not sure how we find so much to talk about week in, week out, but we do. And that call every Friday, knowing it's going to be there, no matter how my week's gone, that helps me when days are tough. And it's a commitment. And that in itself, committing to something that matters, that's life-giving for me. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the people of Inclusive Gathering Birmingham, who, through the wonderful techie marvel that is Zoom, have become a real anchor for me. I've never met any of them in real life. Uh, I hope to when all this is done. And I live hundreds of miles away from Birmingham, down here in the southwest. But they've welcomed me and I'm proud to call them friends. Oh, one last thing. Books. Reading has always been so important to me, and particularly now that things aren't easy, it's really good to lose myself or find myself in a book. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm a member of the Inclusive Gathering, and I'm a local GP here in Birmingham. We're just going to take a moment to pray for medical workers with this prayer from Christian Aid. If you'd like to pray along with us, you can or you can just let the words wash over you. Restoring and healing God, thank you for medical workers everywhere, embodying sacrificial love in these challenging times, putting the welfare of others before their own, staying away from their family and loved ones, comforting the concerned and bereaved, reassuring the anxious and vulnerable, working to heal and restore people who are ill. Be their guide, strength, wisdom and hope. Good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Rachel and I work in public health. Um, I've been asked to kind of give a bit of an update um, on how as a community we can be um, praying for and um, thinking about the NHS. So I've asked um, a few others to kind of give me some feedback on things they would really appreciate prayer for. Um, obviously immense strain um, that people are on. One of my colleagues was explaining how there were all these important things that they were trying to initiate like um, smoking cessation services in hospitals. But then COVID happened um, and then they tried to start doing these important things again and her phrase was, and then COVID kept happening, which I think is probably how all of us feel. Um, but just, I think, being there on the front line and someone who's, people who are making decisions about resources, um, it's it's really that challenge of resilience. Um They've been at it for a long time and it's still going. So the specific prayer requests were for energy, um, for people um, in 
the NHS for um, yeah, resilience, as I've said, and perseverance. That for people of faith um, and for Christians who um, are particularly working on the front line, that they would find a way to, I guess, feel sustained um, in a relationship with God um, and that they are able to keep sharing love um, with their colleagues and with patients. Um, one of the things was that um, there's not much time to communicate well um, with patients about difficult situations so um, I guess kind of wisdom with that and space for people to have important conversations especially people that are more vulnerable or people where English isn't their first language so yeah I'll just pray briefly and feel free to join in in your own way um, or offer up your own thoughts on what I've shared Father God, thank you that you are so aware of all our needs and you, you love when we ask you for what we need. And we thank you for um, our NHS, thank you for um, the people that make decisions, thank you for the people that are working there on the front line. Um, and thank you for that your your love um, is, is great. And... We just ask that you would um, give us wisdom in how we can be praying um, on these things that we've heard about and I've heard about from my my friends um, and my colleagues. Um, we just ask that by your your power that your hand would be on um, these people uh, across our um, nation uh, to give them uh, a real inner strength. Um, uh, an awareness of your love um, uh, an ability to keep going I pray that you would provide the, the practical things that are needed uh, the resources um, the staff um, beds, medicines vaccine supplies um, and that you just help people to keep on encouraging one another Amen so we're really excited, as I mentioned, to have Paula Gooder with us today, who's a, a writer, a theologian, a lecturer, and um, she's currently the, the Chancellor of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And she's recently published a book on um, parables, and so we thought it would make a lot of sense to have her come join us today and to just dig straight in and, and talk about one of the stories that Jesus told. If you haven't been with us, for we've been doing this series on Jesus' stories and trying to look at them in fresh ways um, since about September. So Paul is going to be talking about this particular story that's in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, which is one of the four stories of Jesus' life that's told by different authors that's part of the, the Bible in the New Testament. So this is uh, Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 32. But what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? They replied, the first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth. Corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him, while tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. Hi, it's great to be here with you this afternoon. And I even more look forward to being with you later when we have a chance for a Zoom call and a conversation. As Danielle may have told you, I've recently written a book on the parables, so I was really excited to discover you are exploring the parables in your services um, and really look forward to talking to you about parables generally later on, but also particularly the parable we're going to be thinking about this afternoon, which this afternoon is the parable of the two sons. So as we open our hearts to hear God speaking to us this afternoon, let's just spend a moment in prayer. 
loving God, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we may hear what you are saying to us today, that we can receive again your love and can respond to the love that you offer to us. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, the parable of the two sons. Um, I'd just like to start by placing it in the context of other parables, because I think it's a quite an interesting thing to do. And it comes as a great surprise to a lot of people that actually there are hardly any parables about families. It's really, really interesting. There's loads about wheat and about trees. There's lots and lots about slaves, but hardly any about families. In fact, there are only two. There's this one and a parallel one in Luke's Gospel. And before you start scratching your head and thinking that you don't know the one in Luke's Gospel, you do. It's the parable of the prodigal son. And when you place those two next to each other, you discover some really, really interesting things about both of them. Um, although on the surface they're completely different parables, this one, of course, as you'll have just have heard, is about a father asking his two sons to go to the vineyard and do some things for him. The prodigal son, as you will know very well, is about a younger son who goes off and then comes back and then there's a big celebration. If you lay aside the dissimilarities, have a think about the similarities for a moment and you'll see that there's a lot connecting these two. Because what you have in both parables is a son who behaves badly initially and then well, and then a son who behaves well initially and then badly. In the parable of the prodigal son, you've got the younger son who initially goes off and wastes all his money and then comes back. But when his father offers him love, responds to that love and is welcomed back home. The other son, the older son, behaves well initially by staying home and not spending all the money. But then when the father reaches out to him to give him love at the end of the parable, declines the love and refuses to have anything to do with the father or his younger brother. Think then about this parable where the father goes and asks them both to work in the vineyard. And then initially you have one son who says, no, thanks very much, I don't want to do it, and then goes off and does it. And then the other son who says, yes, of course I'll do it, and then doesn't do it. Um, you can see that actually, although they look different on the surface, underneath you have a very similar dynamic going on. It's about how you respond when someone reaches out to you either by offering love, as in Luke's Gospel, or by asking you to do something, as in Matthew's Gospel. So you begin to see that actually at the heart of this parable is a response and the, the question of response and how we respond. And I think what's really interesting to me about understanding this parable is that recognition that actually um, what is really going on here is it's not about either what you say or about what you do first. It's about how you respond in the end. And I think both of them are reflecting on this theme in a slightly different way. So the first thing I'd like to draw out of this for us to reflect on is actually what that means for us in our walk with Jesus. Um, and for me, it's an enormously reassuring message is what well, on one hand re enormously reassuring and then on another hand quite challenging. The enormously reassuring bit is that actually you can get things wrong but ultimately it is how you come and respond to Jesus when you encounter Jesus. So you can get things wrong left, right and centre but nevertheless at the heart of it it's how we respond to Jesus. The slightly more challenging bit about it is that, as you discover in this parable, um, it's not actually about what you say. So you can put together the best words possible, you can respond um, apparently verbally in exactly the right kind of way, but actually if you're not doing anything, then it has no impact at all. And I think for us, that can be quite a challenging thing. We're really good at talking the talk as Christians, but are we equally good at walking the walk? Are we good at living out in our lives actually what Jesus is asking us to do? And when you recognise that this parable is all about how you respond to Jesus's teaching and then how you live it out in your lives, it becomes a little bit more challenging. What you do with your money, 
how you respond to people on the outskirts of society, what you do in situations when powerful leaders require you to do something. It actually really does challenge us about how we live our lives. So first point, um, it's actually about how we live and not what we say or um, how we respond in the first case instance. The next thing I'd like to draw your attention to, and it's very linked to the first point, um, is the whole question about honour. So one of the important things in the first century at the time of Jesus is to recognise that there was a culture that is known by um, anthropologists um, as an honour-shame culture. What that means is that people's value in the world was entirely shaped by whether they were given honour or not. And if they were honoured, they had a high value in society. If they were shamed, they had a low value in society. Incidentally, the prodigal son is about honour and shame as well. We could talk about that later if you are interested. But in this parable, it comes out in the way in which the sons respond to their father. So the first son, the one who says, um, I won't do it, actually gives his father no verbal honour at all. So um, the father says to him, son, will you work for me? Um, the son says, no. Um, the Greek says simply, I won't. Um, but he doesn't give him any titles of honour. The second son does give him a title of honour and gives him the correct title of honour. He calls him Lord, which is a very deferential thing for a son to do, but gives the father proper honour in the society. Of course, the wrinkle of this parable and why it's really interesting is that the son gave the father verbal honour, but not actual action honour. And so it again kind of drives us back to that first point that I was making earlier on, which is that um, the important thing is not what you say, the important thing is what you do. And in an honour-shame culture, where honour is so very important, um, actually simply giving people the right names, using the right titles, is not the most important thing. It's actually how you respond to them, which is crucially significant. And um, the thing I often reflect on in an honour-shame culture is that it's really easy for us to say, well, we don't really function that way anymore. We don't really have an honour-shame culture. Except for when you think about it, we really do. We just express it in a different kind of way. Think about social media and how people respond on social media. It's not about titles, but we do very much honour some people and shame other people. Um, just look at the shaming that goes on in social media. And you begin to recognise that actually we do function still with a very important honour-shame culture. So in this instance, just imagine that um, what we're thinking about is it's all very well if you um, say to somebody and can use really nice words to describe how important they are and, and what's going on and why you think they're very significant. But actually, if by your actions you shame them, you are still shaming them, even if you're using the best language. And again, when we're thinking about our life in Christ, for me, it's a really striking thing. Um, that it doesn't matter what language we use of Jesus, it doesn't matter how we respond um, in our words about who Jesus is. Actually, it's about how we honour Jesus by how we live our lives, the choices we make, the, what, the actions that we do. And again, we're back to that same point again, that actually it's how we live, which is the really crucial thing. And then... A final point that I want to draw your attention to in this parable is um, this is one of three displacement parables in Matthew's Gospel, and they come one after the other. We've got this one, the parable of the two sons, then we've got the parable of the wicked tenants, and then we've got the parable of the wedding banquet. And in each of these three parables, um, some people are displaced in favour of other people. So in this first parable, the parable of the two sons, Jesus suddenly, apparently out of the blue, um, brings in a category of people who are going to go in before other people. So if you have a look at verse 32, um, Jesus says, oh, well, actually 31 um, first. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. 
but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. So what Jesus is saying there is, in the light of all of this, about how you respond in your actions as well as in your words, um, those who respond are the ones who are going in first. The second parable, the parable of the tenants, um, is the one in which the original tenants of the vineyard are chucked out because they don't uh, recognise the son when he comes and are replaced with other people. And then the third parable is the parable of the wedding banquet. And you may remember lots of people are issued invitations, they all decline, and the people from the highways and byways are then invited in instead. So you have this theme of the people who ought to be in, who are then displaced by other people. And again, when we have a conversation later, it may be something that you want to explore a little bit about what Jesus is talking about here. But I think what is really crucially important um, in this particular parable is that what Jesus is doing is again reflecting on genuine response. He's not interested in fancy words. He's not interested in people's status. Um, the people who think they're getting in are probably not getting in. And by getting in, we're talking about the kingdom of God here. People who think they're in may well not be in. It's actually the people who respond from the heart and in the way in which they live their lives. And so what Jesus is saying here is that you might think the tax collectors and the prostitutes are way, way out of the kingdom of God. Actually, they're in first if their response is right. So for me, there's something really powerful about this parable because it gets right down to the heart of what we think faith is about and asks us to reflect time and time again on whether what you are actually doing, not what you say, not what you say you think about all sorts of different things, but what you actually do. Is that a response to the Jesus who loves you? The Jesus who says, come follow me. How are you really responding in your lives? And for me, there's something really, really powerful about that, that Jesus still says, will you come follow me? I'm not interested about what you say. I'm not interested about your fine roles or your great status. I'm simply interested in how you live your life in response to me. And in that, I think there's a lot for us to reflect on. Open 
my eyes I wanna see you Open my ears I wanna hear you speak Tell me your thoughts What's on your mind I'll be your friend I wanna see through your eyes I wanna see through Welcome to this part of our service, which is about a fellowship meal together. Though we may, we may be separated by quite a distance, this is our attempt to have and share a fellowship meal together. This is something uh, that in Methodist Church we would call a love feast, and has been shared by countless Christians over many centuries. I'm going to hand across to Eunice for a passage of scripture before we eat. Thank you, John. So the couple of verses that I've chosen are from Psalm 46, and they say this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth could change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is our refuge has felt like a really important verse to me. In this week, when we have seen the really traumatic and heart-wrenching news of how many people have died across the UK, compounded by how many people have lost their lives across the world. It's a heart-wrenching time to live. And the question of where is God in this is a one that we have to confront ourselves with. I believe in a God who is with us in our pain, who journeys with us in our suffering, and a God who is present with us in the pandemic and who offers ultimately signs of hope, even when they are difficult to see. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Life will not always be like this. Things will change. The river will flow. We will be nourished again. And so it feels important as we share this meal together to remember that no matter what, God is with us. God is our refuge and our strength. Before we eat, we'd like to pray with you. Holy God, we thank you that you are our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help 
in joy, in pain and difficulty. We thank you that with the psalmist we can say that no matter what, you are with us. We thank you for that knowledge. We thank you that there is a river whose stream makes glad the city of God. Holy God, we pray for one another. We pray for the deep sorrow around the world. We thank you that you are here with us. And as we take now this food and this drink, may we be nourished by you. May we know the water of living, flowing life that comes from you. Amen. If you notice in the New Testament, even when things were difficult, even when the disciples after Jesus' death wondered what on earth life was meaning for them, Jesus came to be with them and shared food. It was a sign to him of hope. And as we share that, perhaps we can take some encouragement that as we share food with each other as Jesus' disciples, we are being offered that hope by Christ himself. Well, mine's a chocolate snowball. I don't know what you're having there. And uh, I can assure you, being a good Methodist minister, this is not vodka, but a glass of water. But we'll take and eat and be thankful. God bless you.
So thanks for joining us today. Um, we're going to reconvene on Zoom at 5.15. You're really welcome to come along and have your mic off and your camera off and just listen if that makes you comfortable. We also, um, we're going to have this Q&A session with Paula Gooder. We can ask her anything we like. You can ask in the chat. You can ask with your mouth. Um, or if that's maybe too intense for you today, we're also going to have some breakout rooms. Um, there's, you know, casual chat rooms and also places where you can do go to, you know, pray or have deeper conversations with folks. We're, we're keeping an eye on the news and the advice, um, but our desire is to, to keep this going. Um, and when we do have opportunity to meet together in person, we'll, we'll let you know about that. But we're planning up through Easter to be, to be online. Um, and one of the things that we did before Christmas in the Advent season was to try to kind of, um, I guess, break out of the barriers of just being online uh, by sending things in the post to folks. And we're planning to do that again. We've got some some ideas in the works of things that we can do together, um, activities that we can kind of do communally, even though we're apart. So if you, you weren't on our list at Advent time, um, there's a connect form in our Connect and Community Facebook group. So if, you, you know, if you're just getting connected with us, feel free to just join that Facebook group. And that's a great way of connecting with people midweek and you'll also find the sign up form there to receive some special things in the post uh, and uh, we'll be sharing more about that as the weeks come so we're starting off the lent season as you do with pancake day and we're doing a pancake day party on zoom if you haven't done cooking together with folks on zoom it's actually a really fun thing to do being in lots of people's kitchens at the same time and you're very welcome to join in uh, and make pancakes along with us if you need help getting ingredients, give us a shout at newchurchbirmingham at gmail.com and we'll get you everything that you need. On the 14th of February, uh, on a Sunday, we're going to be starting off a Lent series with thinking about the book, Queer Virtue. And if you'd like to read the book ahead of time, uh, we recommend that to you. You can, uh, but if you don't, don't worry. Uh, Julie and Sam are going to tell you what it's all about. I haven't mentioned this for a bit, but if you are interested in supporting the work that uh, Inclusive Gathering does, um, you can go to inclusivegathering.org.uk forward slash give, and there's ways to make a one-off gift or to um, to sign up to give regularly if you're a regular part of your, our community. There's no pressure at all to do this. Um, it, it goes to fund some of the basic stuff that we that we do and allows us to be generous, and I hopefully over the next uh, weeks and months you're going to see how more of those funds are being being used um, to, to, to be generous and to give and to do things like send nice stuff in the post and uh, encourage you. Before we can move over to Zoom, I'm just gonna finish with the, the blessing that we share every week. May we live fully, may we love wastefully, and may we have the courage to be all that God has created us to be. See you soon. <laughs> Vamos falar?